Thank you, Gary. Good morning, everyone. What a fabulous session this is. I'm really honored to be up here with my colleagues. And what I'm going to present will be, I think, complementary to what you've already heard. And my, I was interested that my talk is similar to Corey's, but on the side of Crohn's disease. So we'll see how I line up. First thing is that I considered the title, so getting back to what uh, Dr. Kane said, uh, and I actually thought that perhaps rather than calling them mistakes, I would call them challenges, uh, because we recognize how hard it is to take care of this really difficult group of patients. As you've already heard from my colleagues, and I'll give my spin on this, uh, one of the general important principles to keep in mind first is uh, the distinction between disease activity and disease severity, and to understand what we mean when we're talking about moderate to severe Crohn's disease. Now, I was assigned severe Crohn's disease, but I want to point out to you that we can lump these together from the standpoint of therapy because that's how our treatments are studied and then ultimately labeled. But the reason that there's been so much emphasis on this may seem quite obvious to this experienced audience. Patients with moderate to severe disease have worse outcomes, and that's where our therapies are. But we should acknowledge the fact that there are patients who have milder disease that progresses over time to present with a more severe complication. And that's where the difference between disease activity and disease severity may separate. And that's important to understand, especially when you're trying to communicate to a patient what will happen after they have surgery or how you might manage them better after you gain control of their disease. I also want to point out, despite the fact that I'm going to focus mostly on severe disease, that mild Crohn's disease does exist, and it's a big data gap. There are lots of patients walking around with it who haven't been diagnosed, and perhaps that doesn't matter. And there are lots of patients who have it who may be symptomatic, and we don't have good evidence, nor do we have good therapies for some of those patients. And an example is the incidental ileitis found by a screening colonoscopy, where you happen to look into the ileum, and to your surprise in this asymptomatic patient, you find ileitis and the biopsies look like Crohn's disease. In fact, and I just had to show you this, this is a um, sub-study from a nationwide UK bowel cancer screening program. So the purpose of that program was to compare flexible sigmoidoscopy to colonoscopy. But they spun off and looked at how often on the colonoscopy they found unexpected Crohn's disease. And in fact, it was pretty high. Um, there was uh, 112 patients who had IBD out of this population. And I'm sure in this audience, you've all seen cases like this or been referred cases like this. And it was interesting that those who were asymptomatic and had normal labs when this was found had a favorable prognosis, as you might expect. For all we know, they've been walking around with it for 20 years. And those who, in retrospect, actually had some symptoms or had abnormal labs when they investigated further were people who really needed treatment. So if you're wondering what to do about the asymptomatic incidental ileitis, this so-called mild Crohn's disease, if their labs are normal and they are otherwise well, you probably don't need to treat that, and you should just do clinical follow-up and see what happens over time. Now, there's been an evolution in our management of severe Crohn's disease, and I wanted to point out a few of the major um, advances in the field. The first one is our better understanding of the approach to diagnosis and the distinction between activity and severity. The second has been our attempt to move from a reactive or palliative approach to a proactive and disease-modifying approach. I think we need to be using this term much more often, and I didn't hear it so often yet at this meeting, but we really are trying to modify the disease. And of course, our rheumatologists have been using that term for a long time, but that's what we want to do. We want to modify what would otherwise be the natural history of the disease, and that's our goal. And by doing so, we can prevent complications and hopefully provide a patient with a better quality of life and really change what's going to happen to them later. We also, of course, want to pay attention. Once a patient has had one complication, what are we going to do about it so that we don't end up with a second complication? Understanding that the patient is already declaring themselves and showing us what their disease behavior is really like should guide us in choice of additional therapies and how aggressive we might be in follow-up. 
So when we talk about activity and severity, let me point out to you again, and I think Corey Siegel wrote a very nice piece on this um, to, de to define this. Activity is what the patient's doing right now. Severity really includes more of their prognosis. How sick is that patient? You can have a patient who uh, hopefully is in remission sitting in your office, but who has a severe or poor prognosis with the factors that Millie so nicely outlined for you. You need to understand that because your choice of therapy in a patient who is sitting in front of you and may be doing well at this moment in time may be different, as should your follow-up and choice of maintenance options for that patient. So keeping in mind that one of the errors in managing severe Crohn's disease is letting the patient declare themselves when you already know that they have a poor prognosis. You're taking a risk that isn't necessary. And too often, we're waiting for the patient to do something or for them to fail a therapy. And that's just not the way we should be managing a chronic progressive disease like this. So I'll break it down, and you've heard this in different ways, but severe activity could be defined as dehydration, sepsis, anemia, weight loss more than 10%, poor growth or development, the presence in active perianal disease or bowel obstruction. And a severe prognosis is the younger age of onset, if you've heard, smoking cigarettes, perianal disease, having penetrating disease, especially at presentation, the need for surgery uh, early or having prior surgeries, and of course the need for steroids early. So you should just be thinking about that individual patient. And they may say they're feeling fine. In fact, you may assess them and believe that they're in remission. But if they have these other prognostic markers, at a minimum, you should be stratifying them to a more careful monitoring strategy so you don't lose track of what's going on. Now, the revolution in management that everyone in this room has heard about um, quite often is this concept of treating to achieve a target. And that's a general theme of what I'm going to focus on as I go through some of the other challenges to managing Crohn's disease. The general principle, of course, is using agreed upon targets for a goal of disease management. And I want to say to you that there aren't necessarily specific targets for everyone with Crohn's disease. These targets should be individualized, just like everything else that we do. What is this target that's reasonable and appropriate and functional for this patient? It then involves the serial disease assessment and adjustment of therapy in some algorithmic or at least pre-planned and agreed upon way. You'd like the patient to buy into this and to understand why we're doing this and what the next step will be if they haven't achieved the target yet. And we know from the CALM study now published in Lancet that this is associated with better outcomes. I'll remind you that that CALM study had as a primary endpoint mucosal healing. They used an objective primary endpoint, not symptomatic, not CDAI-based. And there are certainly many aspects to this that are not known yet. We shouldn't necessarily assume we should treat everyone to target and therefore burn through all the available therapies, because that isn't the right way to do this either. So we have some challenges. So the common challenges when managing patients with Crohn's disease diagnosis, as you've heard from my colleagues already, sequencing therapies, timing of surgery, and prevention after surgery. I'm going to cover a little bit of each of these now. So the first thing, of course, is, is this really Crohn's disease, making the diagnosis? Here's a patient who actually was uh, 23 weeks pregnant uh, and presented to our emergency department, and she had a history of IBD, and this is what her very limited flexible sigmoidoscopy looked like. And you can see here what might be called Crohn's, but in fact, that, those aren't ulcers. That's complete absence of mucosa. This was actually a patient with severe UC who needed surgery, uh, and had a, an ileostomy, and then after she delivered at term, she had a J-pouch ultimately created. So knowing your diagnosis, of course, is important, and understanding that piece. Here's another one that perhaps we don't know enough about, but we should. Uh, is it really Crohn's disease? There's the emergence now of this very early onset IBD group. They're described by Mendelian genetic abnormalities that have been better described, and there's an international consortium working to characterize these patients, and you can refer your patient if you suspect this is happening. And although I know the majority in this room are adult gastroenterologists, uh, the reality is that if you have somebody who was diagnosed with quote unquote Crohn's disease at an age of six or younger, or you suspect it may have started that early, then you should be thinking about whether this is one of these other well-characterized disorders because the treatment strategy in these situations is different. And if you want to know more about this, I would refer you to the very nice website 
which is veoibd.org, uh, and you can refer patients, you can read all about it, and I think we as a group need to do this. This to me is a very good example of where our field should be going, which is better characterization of very specific disease types that could lead to very distinct disease treatments. Challenge number two, which is the one we talk about the most when we're thinking about all this, is undertreatment. Corey did a nice job uh, outlining that in ulcerative colitis. But this can have a couple of different flavors. One is that using therapies that have not been shown to be disease modifying or don't achieve the intended goal of their use. Of course, one of the examples is 5-ASA for penetrating or fibrostenotic Crohn's disease. Of course, they're safe, but we know they're not disease modifying in that specific population. The really nice studies to look at 5-ASA for mild luminal Crohn's disease haven't been done yet. In addition, of course, we appreciate underdosing of our current medications. There have been multiple analyses that demonstrate that when we've used thiopurines, we've often underdosed. And when we're using our biologics, even in our best efforts, when we are looking at therapeutic drug monitoring or other measures, unfortunately, and this isn't always our fault, we aren't getting enough drug into the patient. So there are some challenges here, and some of it, of course, as many who follow me on Twitter know, is very limited by our payers and insurance companies. So how do you approach under treatment, just remember that for every treatment you use, you must do serial assessment and make sure it's getting you what you want. Whether that's 5-ASA for mild Crohn's or whether it's your patient who insists on trying dietary management, serial disease assessment, objective assessment to know that you're making progress is critically important. So don't settle. Don't let your comfort with the safety of a medication be a substitute for confirming its efficacy. The same could be said for your patients who want to try something complimentary because they have read or are afraid of treatments that you're recommending. Next point. This is also about undertreatment. Never ignore rectal inflammation. So here's a colonoscopy of a patient of mine, and the retroflex view on the right shows you these deep ulcers in the distal rectum. You know what's coming next if this isn't treated adequately. So this patient may or may not have severe symptoms, but when you see these deep ulcers in the rectum, you should be aggressively treating, and I would argue that you should be evaluating them closer and even taking a look and trying to make sure that you get this healed and under control because, of course, perianal Crohn's disease, once it happens, has the worst quality of life of the types of patients with Crohn's disease and is often an irreversible and challenging fibrostenotic complication. So treat this aggressively. Look carefully at the distal rectum when you're evaluating these patients. Then there's what I call premature de-escalation. So is your patient going to do what you say? Um, stratify your patient for follow-up to make sure you re-emphasize what they need to do to stay on therapy and why they're on maintenance therapy. Did you achieve successful induction? I learned from Steve years ago that if you transition to a maintenance plan before you successfully achieve induction, you're going to fall backwards. So you need to make sure that you achieve your induction goal before you shift to your maintenance strategy and, in, in essence, de-escalate in some way. Don't give up too early. So keeping the intensity of therapy on long enough is really important. If you only wait until the patient says, I'm feeling better, before you start transitioning to a maintenance strategy, you may lose. In addition, and corollary to this, is you don't want to wait too long either. You don't want your patient suffering unnecessarily because you're waiting months and months for a therapy that should have had its peak effect at eight weeks. And lastly, with post-operative patients, don't get burned by the patient who's now feeling well. It's common for people who've gone through sequential therapies before they ultimately had what they really really needed, which was an ileal resection, to feel so much better that you and the patient are relieved and you want to give them a break. The reality is that if you wait too long to reassess that patient who needed surgery, you're going to miss your window of opportunity. And we've learned that from Miguel's nice work with infliximab and post-op Crohn's. In the people randomized to placebo in his original study, when they offered them infliximab at the one-year endpoint of the original study, those who had had placebo and had recurrence, they could only recapture some of them because a year had gone by with progression of their recurrent Crohn's disease. So monitor and make sure you do so early in patients in whom you suspect a more aggressive disease. Challenge number three, you might not have expected to hear from me uh, talking about in this difficult patient population, but it's actually over-treatment. 
Overtreatment is something we don't talk uh, enough about, but it certainly has many uh, implications for safety and cost. One of the things about overtreatment would be the overuse of steroids, and of course we've been banging that drum for many, many years. But in general, we taper too long, we, ought, we use these too often, and we have appropriate options, and we know more about this. Adrenal insufficiency is rare. Um, tapering because you're worried about that is important, but you should really be thinking carefully about how long you really need to do that. If you understand how a steroid sparing therapy is supposed to work, you should be able to time your taper to coincide with that. And when a patient demonstrates steroid dependence, you should be adjusting your treatments to get them off of them earlier. The other is escalation to therapies that are not really needed. It is not appropriate to be uh, endorsing or even recommending that every medical therapy should be tried before you send your patient to see your surgical colleagues. It is um, going too far in that situation, and for someone who has a limited ileal uh, stricture, this is certainly something that we are much better at managing post-operatively than trying to use medical therapy for it is essentially scar tissue. There are all sorts of other examples of overtreatment. One might be premature drug switching or intensification before the actual efficacy of the therapy you are using starts to work. The second might be therapeutic intensification for symptoms unrelated to bowel inflammation. Treating an irritable bowel with more immune suppression is a good example. How about prolonged or repeated co-prescription of steroids in patients who are already on biological therapies? Overuse of combination therapy in patients treated with Vito and used to Kinemab, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. And then lastly, trying to get to endpoints that are too hard to do and may not impact on ultimate clinical outcomes. In other words, perfect can be the enemy of good enough. Know how far you need to go so that the patient's gonna have a good outcome and try to stop there. So what does that actually mean? Well, first of all, in a patient who's had surgery and is now having some symptoms, recall that in the short interval, it's almost never recurrent Crohn's that's giving them those symptoms after surgery. There's lots of obvious uh, explanations, and none of them are inflammatory. So this can be the post-resection diuresis of a hypertrophic ileum that's squeezing things through the absence of a stricture and the absence of a valve. It can be, obviously, bile salts. It can be an opioid-related narcotic bowel, and, of course, bacteria bacterial overgrowth. So think carefully about who these people are and don't escalate inflammatory therapies in that situation. So the theme, though, is the same as for undertreatment. Make sure you know what's actively inflamed. Get your team working together early. Consider whether you need combination therapy in everybody. Be careful about stacking one drug on top of another. If the first drug isn't working as well as it needs to or at all, you should probably be stripping it away before you start a whole new mechanism. Too often we kind of lose track and they're still getting those infusions that we forgot about. Then we're adding steroids and oral therapies on top of that. So what about combination therapy? So we heard from Millie that the first comparative effectiveness study in Crohn's disease and a landmark study in our field was the SONIC trial. And we took away from SONIC that at least with infliximab, combination with azathioprine was superior both at achieving clinical steroid-free remission at week 26 and at mucosal healing. Well, we've learned a little bit more about that that I'll show you on the next slide. It's actually more about the PK and the level of infliximab than it is necessarily about some synergy with azathioprine in other ways. It's not necessarily about two mechanisms. Secondly, we've learned at least with the data we have so far that the low immunogenicity of ustekinumab and vetalizumab don't um, require or at least benefit significantly from combination therapy, especially when the patient has already failed a thiopurine or methotrexate before you get to those two drugs. So you may not need to do it there. And remember that when you're using unnecessary combined approaches, you will also be exposing the patient to more side effects or adverse event risks. So you have to carefully understand why do I have them on two drugs when they may not need them. Now, I'm not here to say that we don't need them ever, but I am here to clarify some of that. So in this nice post hoc analysis from Sonic that was just done recently, so the Sonic study is 10 years old, but we already are still learning from it, uh, I want to point out to you that the bottom line here was that uh, the benefit in Sonic was seen more from infliximab levels than necessarily from the combination approach. In other words, patients in the monotherapy infliximab arm who had high trough levels of infliximab did just as well as the patients who are on combo therapy with azathioprine. So it may not be needed in all situations. I still use combo therapy with my anti-TNFs in my sick patients with Crohn's or my more complex patients, at least for the first six months. 
Now, what about the approach to non-response? This is another major challenge, and this is, of course, what you thought we'd be talking a lot about, which is what do you do when they're not responding to anything? So first of all, just the basics. Are they inflamed? Get, again, getting back to objective measures. Are they infected? We've heard a little bit about that. And lastly, where is the drug? And this is a problem. So if you take a careful history, and I put this cartoon together, this is, uh, the black line is actually representative of activity of disease, and the hyphenated horizontal line represents clinical remission. And then you put on top of that serum drug concentrations, which are in red. After loading, and each arrow represents a dose of drug, you can see you have plenty of drug present. The patient goes into clinical remission. And what starts to happen over time is that their clinical symptoms are breaking through, and that can correspond to objective disease activity as well. You see also that what's happening in corresponding to this is the drop in drug concentrations. Now, the point of me showing you all this is to say if you take a history from the patient and they're clearly telling you that they break through in some obvious way on a repeated basis, and then they respond when they get their dose of drug subsequently, you know this is most likely attenuation. This requires a pharmacokinetic adjustment, dose intensification. That's different than this scenario where the patient is doing great and now they're not. Now that can be from development of antibodies, it can be from an infection, but there's plenty of drug present in some of these situations and therefore you would treat this a little differently and you obviously would want to think carefully about what's going on. So who is at risk for developing anti-drug antibodies? The last major point of this uh, part is to just point out to you that people who are bottoming out their drug levels between doses are the people who are at higher risk. It's like getting episodic therapy, but it's pseudo-episodic because you're trying to treat them regularly, but the pharmacokinetics are such that they're bottoming out. The other one is the patient who developed anti-drug antibodies previously really important. So the message is, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. If your patient developed anti-drug antibodies with their first anti-TNF, you know when you cycle to the next one that they're at a higher risk for having that happen as well. So protect your patient, monitor your patient. This is the scenario where you definitely want to be using combination therapy and monitoring their drug levels as you move forward. Now, I'm not taking you through this entire algorithm. I'm just going to show you that one of the other challenges we face in Crohn's is really the difference between swapping and cycling. When do we jump to a different mechanism? And that has to do, again, with taking that careful history and understanding how to assess the patient and know whether or not the drug you're using is achieving the goal you need and whether that mechanism makes sense. Stick with the mechanism that's working if you have demonstrated that they have response to it. Optimize the current therapy. And if they developed antibodies to that first TNF, but the TNF really worked, try to stay with it with another drug within class. Remember, too, that biosimilars will have the same reaction that the originator did if they have antibodies. And my very last point is you can restart anti-TNFs after a drug holiday. I would encourage you to read what I think is one of the best papers on this, which was by our colleagues in Belgium, um, Barrett and colleagues in CGH in 2014. If a patient didn't develop anti-drug antibodies, if they came off drug because they had surgery or insurance or they just chose not to continue, you can sometimes go back if you use therapeutic drug monitoring to assess after a single reinfusion. So you can actually cycle backwards to a drug that may have lost response previously. And this may be due to the shifting inflammatory pathways that we're uh, actually modifying with different treatment strategies. So my last challenge goes right to what um, Millie presented, which has to do with understanding the communication with our patients and diagnosing people with anxiety uh, or depressive disorders. We need to be screening for those in our office, and as we've learned from Eva, Eva Sigethy and others, when you're screening, you better have the resources to then refer your patients, so make sure you have that in place as well. Also, we don't do enough about talking to patients regarding sexual function in interpersonal relationships, which can take somebody who has under control Crohn's disease and put them into a disabled state. It's really important to ask those questions and to make sure that you have resources for those patients. And lastly, um, when the patients are doing well is also when you need to be seeing them. You don't want a clinic that is just crisis management. You want to have the opportunity to say, here's where we are as a field, here's why we should continue your therapy or not, here's what we're going to do to monitor you, and here's what I think we should do together.
So in summary, I actually have presented you with the challenges and some clinical pearls about managing this type of Crohn's disease. Remember that severity includes and means prognosis. It may be different than the activity in that patient. Use your treat to target strategy, but use it wisely. Avoid over-treatment by using objective measures and taking a careful history from your patients and communicate early and often with your patients. Thank you very much.